Massive crowds and joyous enthusiasm greet Pope Francis as he arrives for a six-day visit to Africa. The pontiff's message to a continent where Catholicism is experiencing its greatest growth. The Pope clarifies last week's remarks about homosexuality and sin, an update from the Vatican. We call them friends on the street because we really are building authentic friendships with them. And taking it to the streets through the eyes of the homeless and the young people dedicated to helping them, we have the story of a missionary program changing lives on both sides. Don't stop until, until we finish what we've been working for, which is, you know, no more abortion ever. In the minority, and a young man's determination to spread the pro-life message in an atmosphere where he is vastly outnumbered. EWTN News In-Depth starts now. The church people, the faithful of the world, is focusing to to South Sudan in order to do good, to bring us peace and to prosper. Giant crowds as Pope Francis touches down in South Sudan, the first pope to visit the world's youngest country. The pope comes with a message of peace to a nation torn apart by internal conflict. Hello and welcome to EWTN News In Depth. Pope Francis's arrival in South Sudan marks the second part of his first apostolic trip of 2023. He just finished his first leg of the trip to the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The Pope initially planned a visit to the sub-Saharan nations last summer, but was unable to travel due to his health. The large Catholic communities in the Congo and South Sudan eagerly awaited his rescheduled trip and hoped that his visit could bring international attention to their situation and inspire peace. I feel like I'm in heaven with God. It's a great day. Thousands lined the road from the airport when Pope Francis arrived in Kinshasa, the capital of the Democratic Republic of Congo, on Tuesday. Catholics make up more than half of the country's population and are the biggest Catholic community on the only continent where the Catholic Church is seeing significant growth in membership and vocations. The Congolese flock eagerly awaited the first visit from the Pope in more than 30 years. I've never seen the Pope. It's such a joy to see Pope Francis. So I don't know what to say. I'm so happy, so overwhelmed with joy and happiness to see the Pope. Francis came to the people of the Congo with a message of reconciliation. He hopes to shine a light on the forgotten situation of the DRC. The Congo is rich with numerous minerals, like cobalt and copper, great biodiversity, and a huge rainforest. Despite these natural resources, the DRC is among the five poorest nations in the world, thanks to a long history of colonizers and foreign groups benefiting from the Congo's land without providing aid to its people. In his first speech to the Congolese people, Pope Francis called out the international community for taking advantage of the Congo's resources and leaving its people to fend for themselves in a devastated economy. Hands off the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Hands off Africa. May Africa be the protagonist of its own destiny. In his short but packed visit, Pope Francis met with bishops, charity groups, political figures, and a stadium filled with more than 60,000 young Catholics and their catechists. On Thursday, Pope Francis celebrated his first Mass in the DRC. More than a million Congolese participated in the first big event of the trip. Many traveled for days to be there and camped overnight on the airfield. Hours before the Mass, the celebration had already begun with singing, dancing, and praying. Once again, the people greeted the Holy Father with contagious joy. Pope Francis implored pilgrims to lay down weapons and embrace mercy. What great good it does us to cleanse our hearts of anger and remorse, of every trace of resentment and hostility. Dear brothers and sisters, 
May today be a time of grace for you to accept and experience Jesus' forgiveness. Francis's message of reconciliation comes at a unique time for a country dealing with deadly conflicts on top of its economic crisis. Dozens of armed groups fight for control of the eastern Congo. More than five million Congolese have been forced to leave their homes. Murders, assaults and kidnappings are common. Pope Francis initially planned to travel to the east to meet victims of the fighting and see the crisis firsthand. Due to a resurgence of violence in recent months, he had to change his plans. Instead, the survivors came to Pope Francis to share their heartbreaking stories. He listened intently as the young Congolese explained the atrocities they had to endure. My father was killed in my presence in Ingwe, near Kikingu, Beni territory by men in training pants and military shirts. From my hiding place, I followed how they cut him into pieces. Then his severed head was placed in a basket. Finally, they left with mom. They kidnapped her. We remained orphans, me and my two sisters. Mom never came home. We don't know what they did with her. In a beautiful symbol of mercy, the survivors laid down items tied to the people who hurt them. This is why I place in front of the cross of Christ the victor, a machete identical to the one that killed my father. After the ceremony, one victim shared that the meeting with Pope Francis filled her with hope. What is coming out of my meeting with the Pope today is that there is hope after meeting him. And I know that what we have asked the Pope, God will do it. Though the shadow of a decades-long conflict hangs over the Congolese, there's no shortage of joy. Immaculate Ilibegiza, author and survivor of the genocide in Rwanda, often guides pilgrimages in her home country. And I love when Americans see these people and say, you know what, these people are happier than us, and yet they have nothing. So the true riches is not really even lays in the, in the gold and diamond and how much you have. It really lays in the, in the hearts of people. With his time in the DRC now over, Pope Francis turns his attention to his flock in South Sudan, where more than half of the country identifies as Christian. Like the DRC, South Sudan is plagued with political strife and ethnic conflicts. Pope Francis calls his trip to the young nation a pilgrimage of peace. Critics question whether papal visits like these accomplish any political or humanitarian goals. Ilibegiza says it makes all the difference to people in those countries. So his presence alone, he doesn't have to say anything. It would change something just for who he is, for who he represents. His presence is huge, it's so important and really good for people. Father Don Bosco Anyala, editor-in-chief of our sister news service in Africa, ACI Africa, joins us now from South Sudan, where he's following the Pope on his pilgrimage of peace. Father Don Bosco, it's so wonderful to have you here with us. You saw the arrival of Pope Francis in Juba, South Sudan, earlier today. Set the scene for us there. What was the energy like? Thank you for having me. Um... The arrival of the Pope, of the Holy Father, coming from the Democratic Republic of Congo was received with the excitement. We had uh, a lot of people gathering at the airport, uh, the laity from different uh, denominations, uh, the clergy, the, the bishops. And um, there was a cry among women who were witnessing the arrival of the Pope for peace peace that the country so much needs, a peace for this country that has known uh, internal conflict, civil war, just after two years of independence from December 2013 to date, the country has been in conflict. And so people who are, who are at the airport cried, made shouts of joy, calling on Pope Francis to push for lasting peace as he interacts with the political leaders. And you mentioned uh, the denominational diversity at the, at the airport. This is a historic visit, the first papal trip to South Sudan and a trip with this ecumenical focus. Can you share a little bit more about why that's important? This is important because of the, the history of um, South Sudan. 
South Sudan gained independence in 2011 after decades of war against the Arabic rule that was formerly the big Sudan. And um, when they talk about the history of this country, they say that the colonial masters who came to South Sudan and the missionaries who were divided, or rather they divided the people. So the Catholics took up some territories, the Anglicans and the Presbyterians took up some territories. And so the country seemed divided along particular religious grounds mm. between Catholics and Anglicans and Presbyterians. But after gaining independence, there has been uh, fights along tribal lines, and there has been a unity of purpose among different regions, with church leaders coming together under the Sudan Council of Churches, calling on the political leaders to give them peace, mm. to mind about the suffering of ordinary people. So the coming of Pope Francis, together with the Anglican Archbishop of Canterbury and the moderator of the Church of Scotland, manifests this unity that has been there among Christian leaders here in South Sudan. And they are seeing it as a, a symbol of the unity of purpose that church leaders have for peace, for ordinary people to enjoy the independence they gained in July 2011. A very critical note that I think only you can share because you know what's going on on the ground. Talking about what's on the ground though, you were a diocesan priest in South Sudan for years. What does the Catholic Church look like in the world's youngest country? Thank you. I served in South Sudan for 10 years before I moved to Kenya, my native country. And I have kept contacts with the South Sudan for the last uh, 20 years that I've been uh, interacting here. That I came here in 2003. The reality of the Catholic Church in South Sudan is that it has kept alive institutions key institutions of the country. It is the Catholic Church that runs learning institutions. So most of the people who have gone to school in this country will tell you that they have gone to school in Catholic schools. Mm. And many schools are named after St. Daniel Komboni, who died in Sudan, in Khartoum and that the missionaries or he founded have continued the work of evangelization through schools. The same can be said about the health sector, that it is the Catholic Church that has sustained health facilities, dispensaries, hospitals, with missionaries involved directly as doctors, as nurses. And that's the same about the humanitarian assistance that many people have found themselves keeping alive and their livelihoods kept because of missionaries, because of the existence of Catholic parishes, and because of the assistance that they get for their food and their basic human needs. It's truly seeing the church as a pillar of civil society, which we see in many places around the country and even here in the U.S., around the world, pardon me. Um, how have Catholics then in Africa responded to the Pope's visit? What do you think is their hope for what the Pope's visit can accomplish in sub-Saharan Africa? The Pope is looked at as a servant of God, a herald of peace. And the latest visit to the Democratic Republic of Congo and to South Sudan, two countries that are in an ongoing civil strife and conflict. Catholics in these two countries in particular, and in Africa generally, look at the Pope as one who is able to make the political leaders convert because he is listened to. His word is taken seriously. Mm. And so Catholics are hoping that this visit will bring some conversion, some transformation on the part of the political class, and that they will begin on a very serious note to walk the path of peace for these two countries and for Africa in general.
something that is so needed. Thank you so much, Father Don Bosco. We're looking forward to continuing our conversation as Pope Francis continues his journey and then makes it safely back home. Thank you. Thank you for having me. The faith is strong in many parts of Africa. Nigeria has the highest mass attendance, according to recent data published by the Center for Applied Research in the Apostolate, also known as SCADA. Examining 36 countries with large Catholic populations, researchers found that 94 percent of Catholics in Nigeria say they attend mass at least weekly. That in spite of a number of violent attacks against Christians across Nigeria in recent years. The study found that Kenya also had a high mass attendance at 73 percent, followed by Lebanon at 69 percent. You can have a more detailed look at this study in an article on the Catholic News Agency website. Before the Pope left on his trip to Africa, he made an important clarification about his controversial remarks last week on homosexuality and sin. That report is ahead on EWTN News In Depth. We go out to the streets four days a week and sit um, and be with the people who are experiencing homelessness. Plus, giving aid to those in need. We talk to both the homeless and the missionaries helping them about the impact of a unique program called Christ in the City. I know that killing people is wrong, and so therefore abortion must be wrong and another young person taking action, this young man's often lonely battle to bring the pro-life message to his public high school. Those reports and more when EWTN News In Depth returns. An important update now on the story we brought you last week after Pope Francis gave an interview to the Associated Press and made worldwide headlines. Days later, he clarified his remarks about the LGBTQ community. His remarks included comments on the persecution of homosexual individuals and a pastoral reminder on sinful conduct. They were received as controversial. The Pope's strong words directed at church leaders in Germany, also in the interview, did not receive as much attention, but are just as notable. Rudolf Gehring from our Vatican Bureau reports. We are all children of God, and God loves us as we are, and for the strength that each one of us has to fight for our dignity. The dignity of the human person is a cornerstone of Catholic social teaching. It's a message that Pope Francis has reiterated throughout his papacy, especially with his outreach to the poor and marginalized. During his interview with the Associated Press, the Holy Father referenced dignity when it relates to laws that criminalize homosexuality and homosexual acts. Being homosexual is not a crime. It is not a crime. Yes, but it's a sin. Well, yes, but let's make the distinction first between sin and crime. Pope Francis mentioned that dozens of countries worldwide criminalize homosexuality. In his AP interview, Francis said homosexuality is, quote, a human condition and urged church leaders to welcome people who define themselves as LGBTQ. In response to a request for clarification from Jesuit father James Martin, the Holy Father wrote, When I said it is a sin, I was simply referring to Catholic moral teaching, which says that every sexual act outside of marriage is a sin. Catholic teaching in the Catechism on Homosexuality states that homosexuals are called to holiness and chastity and that homosexual acts are intrinsically disordered. This interview is the first time a pope has condemned laws criminalizing gay sexual activity. The wide-ranging interview with the Associated Press also covered the German synodal way. Francis criticized the process as unhelpful and elitist risking ideological harm to the Church. The Synodal Way is a multi-year process in which German church leaders and laity are looking at the power in the Church, the priesthood, the role of women in the Church and sexuality. German Bishop Georg Betzing criticized the Pope's remarks, questioning why the Pope didn't mention his views to German bishops when he met with them in Rome a month ago instead saving his remarks for an interview. Batzing said Germans view synodality differently than Francis does. 
On top of the Pope's remarks was a letter the Vatican sent to church leaders in Germany decrying the synodal way. Betzing dismissed the letter days later. After the meeting of the bishops' conference with the Pope a month ago, Betzing said Germans don't wish to depart from Catholicism, but to quote, be Catholic in a different way. Betzing repeatedly emphasized he will work to ensure homosexual couples continue to be blessed, as happened in churches throughout Germany in May of 2021. In a sign of tension within the church in Germany, Bavarian Bishop Stefan Oster directly criticized Bishop Betzing at the meeting of the Synodal Way in September. What we are considering together will be presented to the Holy Father for consideration in order to introduce it to the Universal Church. You, Bishop Betzing, are now announcing that you are going it alone. And I wonder whether you are, in a sense, anticipating something that was always planned if the majority does not go along. I'm really struggling with that. I would also struggle if that is the plan of the synodical way. With his latest statements, the Pope has now tried to regain control of a situation that threatens a schism within the Church. But most participants of the German Synodal Way have already voted in favor of draft documents calling for changes to Church teaching on homosexual acts, the ordination of women and more, prompting accusations of heresy. At the Vatican, Rudolf Gerich, EWTN News, in depth. This story is very nuanced. EWTN News Executive Editor and Washington, D.C. Bureau Chief Dr. Matthew Bunsen joins me to provide further insight. Matthew, thanks for being here. Why were the Pope's comments on homosexuality received as controversial? Well, they were controversial, or at least viewed it as such, for two different reasons. Uh, the first was that uh, this is one of the very first times that we've heard a Pope as, as has been reported, actually speaking out about the decriminalization mm. of various laws around the world. That itself was noteworthy. Mm -hmm. Where the controversy came in, though, is that uh, there are those who were upset uh, at his restatement, basically, of church teaching, and requested a clarification, which Francis, I think, was willing to give, especially mm -hmm. because you have to be very specific here, uh, making a differentiation between orientation and acts. Uh, that very clear separation of the two becomes even more important given where the direction is headed with some of the contention surrounding this whole issue. And there's a connection here to his comments on the German Synodal Way, German Synodal Path as well. Can you give us that connection? Well, that's right. Well, so in this interview, the Holy Father used those key words that he called it an ideology. It's ideological. He used the phrase that this is unhelpful, which it certainly is, uh, as well as elitist. One of the aspects, uh, as Rudolf Gehrig was just reporting, of this synodal way is to unravel so many of the Church's teachings on sexuality, in particular same-sex uh, activities, uh, and that the whole of the Church's teachings on homosexuality. So the Holy Father, in calling out the Germans, isn't simply just focusing on the question of homosexuality, but is really placing within the wider context that this is far removed from his own vision of synodality, which as he himself in this AP interview restates church teaching, it, it tries to certainly, by going back to the catechism and what it says. So there's clarity here, but at the same time there's a warning from Pope Francis that this is not the direction he wants Germany going. Synodality that comes from a place of acknowledgement of the deposit of faith and what we all know to believe is true church teaching. But the Germans, uh, the German elitist movement yeah. isn't the only one that is pushing for these changes in the church. There are other voices. Tell us about that. That's right. Uh, it is absolutely true that uh, the synodal path, the synodal way in Germany has supporters, in particular in the area of the ordination of women, uh, mm -hmm. certainly to the uh, permanent diaconate, as they're calling it, but also in the area of, of church teaching on sexuality. We have, for example, a very clear statement from Cardinal Jean-Claude Ulrich of Luxembourg, mm -hmm. who, it is important to stress, has the role of relator general for the synod on synodality that's coming up, who has advocated for a significant change in church teaching and that as it relates... He's compiling... He's the one who's basically in charge of shepherding the process mm -hmm. of the synod. So the fact that he is speaking publicly uh, about 
changing church teaching where it comes to human sexuality, in particular uh, the church's uh, teachings on homosexuality. And chastity. And chastity has set off a lot of alarms. This was then followed by Cardinal Robert McElroy of San Diego, one of the newest of the cardinals and youngest of the cardinals, named by Pope Francis just this last year, has also called for a kind of separation, uh, a blurring of the distinctions between orientation and activity. So this is not exclusive to Germany. So then quickly, Matthew, what lies ahead for this issue in Germany and in Rome? Well, what we're seeing is a very deliberate effort on the part of the Germans to set their agenda as part of the wider agenda for the Synod on Synodality. We had a letter from Cardinal Grech and also Cardinal Ulrich saying you cannot impose ideologies on the Synod. But based on the very statements from Cardinal Ulrich, Cardinal McElroy, and from the Germans themselves, I think they plan to plow ahead with doing everything they can to raise this as a fundamental issue in the discussions this October in Rome. It seems we might need more clarifications from Pope Francis. I expect we will. Thank you so much, Matthew. Good to be with you. Taking compassion to the streets. Next, we go to Philadelphia to talk to young missionaries with Christ in the City about their mission to help the poor and the homeless. We'll be right back. To know that the missionaries are here to stay now and to really, really build those friendships, um, that is like such a gift. A special program expands from Denver to Philadelphia. Young people becoming missionaries in urban areas where the growing populations of poor, homeless, and forgotten desperately need their help. Our focus turns now to young people inspired to create a culture of encounter. With the organization Christ in the City, they're helping address the feeling of isolation among those in need so that they are seen, known, and loved. Rizal Regis reports. And I hope y'all have a beautiful, blessed day, and everybody treats y'all the same way. Making each person in the street feel seen, known, and loved. I love you a lot. Christ in the City's vision is to create a culture of encounter. Christ in the City is both a formation program for young adult volunteers, we call them missionaries, um, and then also our apostolate is service to the poor, so going out on the streets every day. While he was teaching at the Augustine Institute of Denver, Dr. Jonathan Reyes had a vision. As the head of Catholic Charities in Denver in 2011, he found Christ in the City to create a program for young adults. The mission? to teach them what it means to live a Catholic life, dedicated to caring for those in need and spreading the good news of Jesus Christ. Now, more than a decade later, the program has expanded to another location, Philadelphia. In the busy streets there, Emma Rochilla serves as program director in the newly established Christ in the City location. She explains that missionaries receive formation in four pillars, intellectual, apostolic, human, and most importantly, spiritual. Over one to two years, these young adults are formed into missionaries for life, knowing, loving, and serving the poor. Yeah, I get to know them, build friendships with them, do things that they enjoy. Um, and then the other side of it is that we are becoming more like Christ in everything that we do. In the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, amen. After accompanying a homeless ministry on a spring break mission to Washington, D.C. in 2018, Colleen McDonough felt a strong desire to continue to serve the homeless. She joined Christ in the City and is now one of the missionaries who walked the streets of downtown Philadelphia. In groups of three, they go out on the same street routes daily, greeting the same homeless people with a smile and trying to build a friendship. Dom Markentel, a missionary in his second year, says Christ in the city has helped him grow in the practice of loving others. There's many, many times on the streets where someone will just share their heart with you, like they've never talked to a person before, just in a way that they they love you and they see Christ in you, and that always has an impact on me. One of the friends they've met so far is Victor. 
who sees himself as a gentle giant living through the grace of God. My faith in God, that's the key. Everything I do, I do to him. Victor found himself living in the streets after battling drug addiction years ago. Now, he says, his goal is just to help other homeless people cope with the struggles of everyday life. I feel like I help people more out here. Uh, and when I help people, I help myself and people help me. How do you feel about our friends here? Christ I City. love y'all. <laughs> I look forward to seeing y'all. Y'all motivate me, believe it or not. You know what I mean? Now, certain people I look forward to because that's my motivation. I ask God, I hope I see them again. Another friend the missionaries have encountered in Philadelphia, who does not want to be named, is still coping with grief. Our homeless friends have often had experiences of ruptured relationships in their lives, um, whether that's a family member or a spouse or a child um, or the loss of someone. His life was turned upside down after losing his mother to cancer. Living in the streets, he says, most of the time he feels invisible. It's a shame that nobody will ever know who personally I am because they never will give me a chance. So recently, I had no friends. That changed when he met Christ in the City missionaries. You and a few other people has helped me and actually motivated me to continue on. I will tell you, it seems very bleak at times. Maria Siebert joined Christ in the City right after graduating from high school. As a second year missionary, she says hearing sincere, grateful words from her homeless friends keeps her going. Being able to hear that, like, yeah, how much we mean to him, that, like, because of our friendship, like, he's still here. He's still, like, willing to push through because he knows he has us to love him. It's just like, whoa, like, <laughs> yeah, like, what we do is for a reason. Like, the Lord does work through us. Over time, missionaries eventually established deep, meaningful relationships with their friends, sharing meals, and sometimes even accompanying them to medical, housing, or prenatal appointments. Don't let like the fear of the awkward or the fear of the unknown keep you from, yeah, meeting Jesus in the poor. Rochelle Rages, EWTN News in Depth. We're joined now by the managing director of Christ in the City. Blake Bruliette has his sleeves rolled up every day overseeing this mission. Blake, thank you for joining us. What is Christ in the City's goal when it comes to addressing poverty? Monse, thank you for having me here. So our goal is twofold. We are aiming to form the general population, the lay, even the priests and religious, but mainly just the general population of Christians to know, love, and serve the poor. And we have definitely been known as a chronically homeless serving organization, but our aim when we serve the poor is to encounter. There are so many excellent resources in Philadelphia and Denver and all over, all over the country that are meeting the basic needs and that must come first. But after that, we know this loneliness, this isolation, this is so prevalent on the streets, in society, and we aim to fight that, that rupture of relationships by healing through relationship. It's beautiful. In her story, Roselle, our reporter, explains that there are four pillars to the missionaries' formation. So the way that you all carry this out, intellectual, apostolic, human, and spiritual. Why did you all choose these four areas? Yeah, our founders were very wise in just looking at what has the church done before. And in the document by John Paul II, Pastoris Dabo Vobis, which is actually how seminarians are formed and other organizations and religious orders, it, it bases on those four pillars. And we, instead of having pastoral, put apostolic on the end. And just seeing the wisdom of the church, knowing that to form or serve the poor is that apostolic pillar. But we look at Mother Teresa, one of our founders, and she knew the spiritual, the human, the intellectual were so essential to properly give the poor 
the face of Christ and what they need, which is love above all else. Absolutely. And you talked about meeting the basic needs. There are ministries that help with food, uh, clothing, addiction, recovery, right? You talked about meeting those yeah. needs as, as one thing and this being something totally different. The fact that you're trying to meet the homeless as they are, but you don't call them the homeless or the poor. You call them friends. Can you explain the reasoning behind this intentional wording? Yeah. When our missionaries go to the streets, when we encourage our those who relate to this movement of service to the poor, we encourage them to have consistency. And the caseworkers, because of their load and their work and all those social services, there are boundaries that need to be established, very strict boundaries. And it's not healthy for them to share about their own lives. And when we go to the streets, we get to know the homeless, the poor, and they get to know us. And that is the beginnings of a friendship. We are not there to, you know, just help them, but we're there to encounter them. And that comes through a friendship. Like Jesus Christ befriended the poor. That is our aim. And it is true friendship. And it's one of those where our missionaries every year go through and just ask themselves, are, are we actually friends? And then mm. we start diving into that question with them and ask them, you know, are you? Are, is this a friendship? And almost resoundingly, it is a yes. The homeless, the poor that we see regularly are excited to see us. We are excited to see them. We rejoice with them and we also suffer with them. The highs and the lows of friendship in the Christian life. So you receive just as much as you give. I know you and I both have shared that we've heard Archbishop Shapu say that yeah. if you don't help the homeless, you're going to hell. Um, and what he really means by that is that all Catholics are called to serve the poor. What advice can you give our viewers if they feel inspired to encounter the poor like your missionaries, but are a little bit awkward about how to get started? Yeah, we'll do this in threefold. So first, if you're in Denver or Philadelphia, please look us up, uh, www.christincity.org, or if you're in any of the areas around that, we'd love to have you come volunteer with us like Monse and her team has seen the house it's it's just a warm and welcoming place if you're in a city um or even let's say you're in a small town right you're in a small town and there may not be homeless the poor are all among us and what is the number one thing you can do even if you have nothing on you and that is giving them your time and your presence so let's say you're in a city and you have the same route to work every day, and there's a man or woman, a brother or sister in Christ at that stoplight, just begin by saying, hey, you don't need anything, just smiling, breaking down that barrier, as we all know, introducing ourselves to someone new, it's a little awkward. Take that awkwardness upon yourself and give that gift to them of just saying hello, maybe it's a smile, maybe that's all you can muster at this point, but just begin by seeing the poor as not a problem to be fixed, but a person to be encountered. And through that, you'll find that you'll want to carry soft foods or water for your friends or the poor you're gonna meet because that's what they need. So we really encourage you make the bar low to begin because that's really how we break this rupture of relationships on the streets. That's how we build new habits. Thank you so yes. much, Blake. Really, really appreciate your time and your wonderful mission. Thank you so much, Monse. We truly appreciate you guys highlighting our work. Memphis mourns and its Catholic bishop responds to the police beating and killing of Tyree Nichols, a case of police brutality that has shocked the nation. Catholic bishops in Peru offer to mediate a peaceful solution to weeks of fighting in the streets between demonstrators and security forces. We'll explain. And religious persecution in Nicaragua. The latest on this bishop arrested after his pushback against the Ortega regime. Top headlines in the Week in Review, up next. A deadly police beating that has horrified the nation tops the week in review. Catholic leaders in Tennessee are calling for prayer and justice for Tyree Nichols, killed after he was held down and beaten by five Memphis police officers. You guys are really doing a lot right now. Bro, Stop. lay down. I'm like, just trying to go home. Man, if you don't lay down. Bro, I am on the ground. 
Nichols, a 29-year-old father and FedEx employee, was pulled over for a traffic stop on January 7th. Authorities released police body cam footage of the beating last Friday. We're only showing you the beginning, as the video soon becomes much too graphic. The district attorney has charged all five officers with second-degree murder. Two other officers were put on leave, and three fire department personnel were fired for providing inadequate medical care at the scene. While federal and state investigations are underway, marches and protests have been held in Memphis and across the country in calls for justice. During Nichols' funeral service this week, his mother called for Congress to pass a police reform bill that was crafted in the wake of George Floyd's death that has been stalled in the Senate since 2021. We need to get that bill passed. Amen. And because if we don't, that blood, the next child that dies, that blood is going to be on their hands. Yeah. Hundreds gathered in Memphis for the funeral, including Vice President Kamala Harris and the families of other black Americans killed by police. We're learning now that personnel files show past disciplinary, disciplinary action against some of the officers charged in Nichols' death. The Diocese of Memphis is calling for police reform and on its Facebook page asked for prayers, writing, Bishop David Talley and the diocese call on our faithful and our community to pray for the eternal rest of Tyree Nichols and to pray that God brings comfort to his family. A deadly attack inside a place of worship has claimed at least 100 lives in Peshawar, Pakistan. More than 200 others are injured. A suicide bomber set off an explosion inside a mosque packed with worshippers gathered for evening prayers in the deadliest terrorist attack in Pakistan in years. Most of the victims, police officers. Authorities are trying to figure out how security could have been breached at the mosque, which is located inside a highly secured police compound. Peshawar is near the border of Afghanistan and is the site of frequent attacks by the Pakistani Taliban. The group denies it was involved. Unrest and turmoil continue to disrupt life in Peru after the ouster in December of President Pedro Castillo when the thrice impeached leader tried unsuccessfully to stage a coup and dissolve Congress. <laughs> people have died since street violence broke out nearly two months ago. Demonstrators are demanding the resignation of President Dina Bularte, the former vice president, who was sworn in after Castillo's arrest on rebellion charges. He was Peru's first president of rural Andean descent, and many of those protesting are members of the indigenous population. Some are students. Others are believed to be members of leftist organizations. The unrest is fueled by high poverty levels and mistrust of authorities after years of government corruption. Pope Francis has called on the violence to stop and has expressed his support of the Catholic Church in Peru, which has offered to mediate between protesters and Peruvian officials. Lo han hecho los miembros de la conferencia de obispos peruanos. The members of the Peruvian Bishops Conference have met, have been praying, and have offered their good services to all the parties involved in conflict, to dialogue, to mediate, to be mediators. The government does have someone to talk to, but there are no people from the other side who want to be known because they really do not want to talk. Show your face, start a dialogue with those who govern, and thanks to the pastors of the church who have offered to be an instrument of peace. Protesters have blocked roads, set buildings on fire, and taken over several airports, prompting authorities to close the country's top tourist draw, Machu Picchu. In an effort to calm the demonstrations, late this week, President Boularte advanced a bill in Congress to move up elections to late this year, a key demand of the protesters, so Peruvians can elect a new government. But lawmakers are deeply divided, and the bill might not pass. In Nicaragua, seven men, including four priests, two seminarians, and a cameraman are facing prison after a judge found them guilty of conspiring against the state. It's the latest move by the dictatorial regime of President Daniel Ortega in his crackdown on the Catholic Church. The men were arrested alongside Bishop Rolando Álvarez last August after they were forcibly kept under house arrest for several days. This video from August shows Bishop Álvarez walking back and forth with a monstrance on the streets he was confined to under heavy police guard. 
Alvarez created a secret human rights office to address government persecution. He remains under house arrest, accused of conspiracy to undermine national sovereignty and spreading fake news. He's the first cleric at the level of bishop to be arrested and indicted since Ortega regained power in 2007. For further insight into the situation in Nicaragua, we're joined by our colleague, anchor Eddie Rodriguez Morel of EWTN Noticias, our Spanish language newscast. Thank you so much for being with us, Eddie. The regime has forbidden Catholic processions, imprisoned priests, and physically attacked and desecrated churches throughout the country. How long has this been going on? Well, 2018 is the year when everything takes a turn for the worse, when things hadn't been really so good beforehand. Ortega came back to power in 2007. At first, before he regained power, he tried to approach the church in a friendly manner to in some way uh, assure or reassure the Nicaraguan population, which, which trusts the church very much. But since he went into power, he's just been on a plan to basically never leave. And in 2018, there was a widespread protest because of a reform in the national pension plan. And as a result of this, the crackdown started with uh, over 300 documented human rights violations, disappearances, murders, tortures. And of course, in that, in that moment, the church sided with the people who were being persecuted because of these crimes. But Ortega uh, started to categorize the church as an enemy of the state. And uh, the biggest enemy was perhaps the most vocal bishop of all, Bishop Rolando Alvarez, who was finally, uh, how would you say, I mean, arrested along with yes. other people who have been sentenced. They have all been charged with the same charges, but Bishop Alvarez has been put aside uh, on house arrest. The other ones have been sent to a prison, which is known for uh, political torture. And it's very hard to find out the details of all of this because the government keeps it close in hand. But this persecution of the Catholic Church, it's not very new in Latin America. I know that you understand this from the history of Catholicism as siding with those who are persecuted and then being cracked down by the government. What led up to this 2007, 2018, these movements? Is this something new in Nicaragua? Uh, well, I mean, we have to just go back a little bit and talk about the the Somoza family, which had basically um, led, governed dictatorially Nicaragua for 40 years with the support of the American government as an alternative to a communist regime. But the Sandinista Front of Liberation, as that's what they call themselves, started to get good press, finally internationally, because Somoza was very brutal in the way it was cracking down in this like uh, cleanup operations where they were just disappearing thousands of people who were opposed to the regime. And so when they came into power, they were recognized by the international community, most of the countries, as a legitimate government. They initially set up a junta, which included people from the private sector and also people from the Sandinistas. But the people from the private sector left soon after that because they realized that this was a project that was being led by Cuba, by the Castro regime to basically led Nicaragua along the, the path of a communist revolution. And this eventually led to um, or, uh, Ortega, who became the president and the leader of the junta, uh, taking retaliation against those parts of the church that did not side with him. Uh, I remember having a student body president at the time in the early 80s when I was going to college in the States who had gone to Nicaragua. He said, man, this is a wonderful revolution and it's very Catholic. Why would he say that? Because there were some Catholic priests in prominent positions in the government who were, of course, uh, working for the agenda, this uh, like liberation theology mindset of uh, people in the church who were cooperating with the regime. When John Paul II came in 1983 to visit Nicaragua, uh, they were um, he he basically called one of them to order, and then the mass, the final mass, was just became a political rally in support of the revolution. John Paul II had to call the people to be quiet; that the church wanted peace. And finally, John Paul II would refer to this first trip to Nicaragua as a dark night that he had to go through yes. when he once again visited in 1996. So, um, so once again, there were people in the church who were very ideo ideological because of this liberation theology line, and they were being favored by the state as the right kind of church. That's and right. of course, people who, who were holding the doctrine were being uh, persecuted from the first time the regime was in power, the Sandinista regime, which fell from power in 1990 and came back to power in 2007 after a public relations campaign 
and Ortega to approach the church in a friendly manner, which, of course, was part of his strategy only. Of course. And you mentioned Cuba, which is something that we've seen before with the Cuban uh, regime registering churches. It's not just Catholics that are engaged in this. How are other religions um, engaged in, in this revolution? Well, Tortera has taken a, uh, like a friendly attitude towards evangelical groups in the country, uh, which have abstained from criticizing the government's uh, human rights abuses. So therefore, um, there doesn't seem to be too much of a voice from other Christians uh, to defend the people who are being persecuted in a brutal way by the regime. And that makes them uh, a preferable religious option for the state who, who does not criticize the evangelicals. And also uh, being that the church, some of the church leaders have try to maintain a kind of working relationship with the government. Some of the Nicaraguans are like uh, confused about what line they should have, whether they should be friendly or where they should really be concerned of the fact that Bishop Orlando Alvarez, I mean, he's not being mentioned uh, in a public way by other church leaders right now, probably because of fear of reprisals. Fear has severe consequences. Thank you so much, Eddie. You're welcome. Glad to be with you. Of course, Nicaragua is but one of many countries with blatant religious persecution. EWTN News In-Depth will continue to monitor this issue around the world so we can help bring it into focus and context. God wants us to stand up for life. That's what we're called to do. This young man's Catholic faith inspires him to fight for the unborn. His message not always welcome among his classmates. The story of why he keeps going next. It can be a lonely mission to fight for the unborn when you have few people around you who support the pro-life cause. That's the situation for one Virginia teenager who chairs a pro-life club in his public high school. But this young man says he's felt called by God to this important work. Reporter Mark Irons has this week's Faith Journey in Depth. Kieran Sweeney said it was the largest crowd of pro-life advocates he'd ever seen. And I was like, wow, there's so many people. A high school senior from Leesburg, Virginia, last month, Kieran came to the 50th annual March for Life in Washington, D.C. with his Catholic church group. Like, I feel here, it's so positive. The following day, he attended the Students for Life National Pro-Life Summit in Washington, surrounded by like-minded young people proudly standing up for unborn lives. Everybody's like, yeah, pro-life, pro-life. But then when I go back to school or back in the real world, like, I feel like just like inside of me, it's like something to kind of keep to myself. That might be his gut feeling, but Kieran, a 17-year-old Catholic, has pushed back. Because I know, okay, the Catholic Church is pro-life. I should be pro-life. I should do something about it. His conviction started to grow about two years ago after he joined fellow parishioners from St. John the Apostle in Leesburg for a life chain, a public display of pro-life support along a city street. I decided, okay, I should start a pro-life club at my school. But then I didn't really do anything about it. For a while, he says he went back and forth in prayer, but couldn't ignore what he was hearing. And the Holy Spirit was just like, hey, 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 you gotta do this, you gotta do this. So last year, with the help of some friends, Kieran started Riverside Students for Life at Riverside Public High School in his hometown. It's supported by the national organization Students for Life. Kieran says his club meets once or twice a month at Riverside. Members volunteer at a local pregnancy support center and have donation drives at the school, leaving out boxes to gather supplies for women in crisis pregnancies. We were actually pleasantly surprised by how much we got donated. Seeing others get involved and support the club has motivated him. It makes me so happy. It makes me uh, just excited, and it, it, it makes me want to do more. But it's fair to say the club is not the most popular one in school. The number of young men and women in Riverside Students for Life is small compared with other groups, and the club has faced challenges, starting with its leader. A lot of people are like, oh, this is a women's issue. Like, why, why should a man care? But it, it's really... It's a human's issue, you know, not just one gender, it's everyone. It's no surprise everyone at Kieran Sweeney's public high school doesn't support his views. It does provide the opportunity to be a witness. What is the best way to be pro-life? Being pro-life isn't just like standing up for life, right? That's a big part of it, but it's also, you know, being kind to people, right? Like treating people with respect and dignity because they're humans and everyone deserves that, that kind of um, treatment. 
And Kieran has kept a lighthearted outlook, even after apparent disdain for Riverside Students for Life became noticeable when the club's posters advertising the group and meeting dates were taken down. We've uh, noticed something we've liked to call the disappearing poster phenomenon, where our posters will, for some reason, go just by the end of the school, they'll be gone. And it, it's really weird. Who took them down and why is unclear. But perhaps even more baffling is pushback from the school's administration over his pro-life club's desired slogan. Every school club slogan must receive approval. The slogan for Riverside Students for Life is, everyone deserves a chance. It may sound pretty generic, but the administration has yet to allow the use of everyone deserves a chance. The reason Kieran received? Just because um, it could cause tension, like it's a sensitive topic. Kieran said that has been discouraging. But all this started with answering something he heard in prayer. And giving up isn't part of the plan. You know, every day I'm just like, okay, God, how can I be your servant today? How can I help you? Over the past few years, Kieran says his faith has become something more than just going to church on Sundays. It's more central to everything he does now. What would you say to somebody who's around your age, but they're hesitant to start something like a pro-life group at their high school, but they think, hey, this could be a good idea? I say go for it. Go for it and it'll be awesome. Like, it might not be perfect. I'm certainly not perfect. God's perfect, though, and he'll help you. With trust in Christ, Kieran remains a voice for the voiceless, even in a place where it's convenient to remain silent. Mark Irons, EWTN News In-Depth. And that's a wrap on this edition of EWTN News In-Depth. I'm Monse Alvarado. Thank you so much for joining us as we explore issues of importance to your Catholic life. We hope to see you again same time next week.